Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to listen to me speak today. Uh, it's definitely an honor. Um, this presentation is going to be on uh, implementing, well, the title is Implementing Service-Oriented Architectures on the, um, on the mobile app. But really what I'm going to be talking about is real world app migration. So there was a bit of a technical difficulty um, between what was on the mobile app and what I'm actually going to be talking about today. But um, the actual description was accurate. So again, my name is Brad Clerkin. I'm a solution principal uh, with one of Slom's, uh, or what, with one of uh, AWS's premier uh, consulting partners, Slom. Uh, I spent the last uh, few years kind of in, in, inside app migrations and um, running large uh, enterprise app migrations to the cloud. So just want to set the stage uh, with some assumptions. Um, first, I'm kind of uh, expecting that you likely understand the why of cloud. And if you don't align with any of these, don't get up and walk out of the room yet. Um, but likely, you understand the why of cloud, right? Um, I don't have to go into that. Um, and if, I, if you don't, right, there's lots of um, really good uh, content out there uh, that I'm happy to share with you afterwards. Come up and talk to me. Uh, additionally, you're considering a set of applications or environments to move to AWS. Again, there's lots of content out there. I think there's actually a session after this about application portfolio management in the enterprise. Um, which we'll kind of talk about, I, I think it'll talk about, I haven't actually seen the deck, but it likely will talk about um, kind of how to determine wh which apps to move first or last. Um, and lastly, right, the assumption I'm working under is that you want to hear about real world challenges of executing an application migration to AWS. All right, so agenda. Uh, I've broken this, the presentation into really three different sections, and hopefully we'll have some Q&A &A at the end. Uh, the first section, I'm going to share uh, two migration stories. Uh, these migration stories, uh, I was the program manager on, so I uh, have some in-depth, intimate knowledge of the projects. Um, that's why I chose them. We're going to hopefully come full circle and share uh, some of the commonalities between the two stories and then dive into the realities of app migrations. Now, the realities of app migrations uh, is a collection across all of our, uh, I think we're at 110 uh, different projects now with AWS and the enterprise. Um, and so I, I went out to a number of my colleagues and kind of said, here's my, you know, what I'm thinking, you know, am I missing anything? And we came up with a pretty uh, substantial list. And then the last piece uh, I wanted to get into because apparently some of the feedback from the summits and reInvent is that, hey, you know, you're telling me the why, you're telling me all this great stuff about cloud, but you're really not telling me, like, how to get it done, right? Uh, really showing me how, right? And so um, I'm going to tell you right now, I've, I've done it in as plain English as I can, right? So there's a number of presentations out there from previous conferences where a consulting firm is standing up here giving you some you know, proprietary framework for moving to the cloud. Um, and that's not what this will be about. This will be um, as straightforward as, as I can get about moving an app or a service to the cloud. There we go. All right, so let's get into the migration stories. Uh, the first one uh, is about a retail servicing platform. Uh, they were a platform as a service provider for some of the bigger, at least still are, <laughs> luckily. Uh, maybe by the story here, you'd think maybe they aren't anymore. Uh, but they're a platform servicing provider for many of the big clothing manufacturers in the world. Uh, they had a, uh, a the, the primary facility that hosted their platform as a service. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this in 2015, but they had a single source of power in the Colo facility. And it's a very known Colo facility provider, so this isn't some kind of mom and pop Colo. Um, uh, you know, I can share that with you later. I don't want to put it on video. Um, but it has a single source of power, right? And that power failed uh, pretty miserably. And the primary facility went down. Um, and like any good enterprise, right, they had a secondary facility for this specific platform as a service. They actually had lots of data centers. Uh, but they really only had two to kind of support this platform as a service. Um, and they had infrastructure there. They had app servers there. They had everything built, right? Um, They're primarily Oracle-based uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is actually the most Oracle apps I'd ever worked with kind of in my career. Um, and they got there, and they started spinning up the app servers. And what they realized pretty quickly is that their release process has completely failed them. Uh, they were anywhere between 2 and 12 months behind on releases in the DR facility. Um, so obviously, pretty quickly, uh, they decided that secondary was unusable, right? And what ensued was a 48-hour outage. Um, and you can imagine maybe the most like, uneventful outage ever, right? Because they couldn't really do anything. They were just sitting there waiting for someone to call them and tell them power was back on. And their phones were ringing off the hook from their customers, right? Asking, hey, why can't I you know, ship my clothing today? Um, I think the CTO summed it up best. He said, customer impact was high, but the impact on re reputation was almost immeasurable, right? So this was kind of their big motivating factor for going to AWS. They wanted to get out of the colo business. Um, and AWS was uh, a clear uh, winner for them. They had developed you know, the why already, and um, that's when they started talking to Slalom. So for both of these stories, 
right? I'm going to go into uh, what their ideal scenario is before we really got into uh, the detailed planning activities. Uh, their ideal scenario was doing a big lift and shift, right? Um, I think we hear this a lot in cloud migrations, right? Just do a lift and shift. Um, and they wanted a bing bang night of migration, right? Uh, they wanted this lift and shift to, ha to take the form of mirroring their production architecture in AWS exactly as it was on premise so that they could, in their mind, have a true active-active hybrid scenario where they were building advanced automation to do concurrent deployments to on-premise and into the cloud, right? So it was a pretty big goal. Um, and they had a lot of smart people, so it seemed you know, viable on paper. Um, additionally, like I said, the lift and shift, they wanted to build a little more automation to do like a big red DR button, right? I think that's the dream of every like, CIO, right? Like, give me that button I can hit, right? To fail over to secondary. Um, and so they actually wanted to not only migrate to AWS from you know, running DR in AWS to running production in AWS, they wanted to do it as like a DR, a real live DR scenario, right? And they wanted to be able to repeat this kind of going back and forth uh, for you know, the coming year as they do software upgrades and things like that. So it was a pretty ambitious plan, right? Um, and they said, hey, you know what? We should be able to do this in six months uh, because, well, we don't have to buy hardware anymore. And that was always our biggest bottleneck. All right, so what actually happened, right? None of that, really. Um, <laughs> Uh, what really happened, right, is we, we kind of talked through the fact that like doing one big migration for all like 25 services, and each one of those services would have anywhere between 20 and 30 databases, 20, 30 applications, right, was just not feasible, right? Like even if, even if you did, you know, automation for the next two years, you, you might never hit that point. And, and was it really what you're looking, you know, is it really the value you're trying to extract, right? And what we got down to is that, hey, if we focus on service by service and run in a hybrid model, um, you know, we just heard a talk on hybrid. I think some of you were here for that. We run in a hybrid model and focus kind of service by service, uh, enabling DR functionality in AWS and then executing that DR plan for that single service um, will, will likely be, you know, more successful. So rather than having like one big red button, right, the, the CIO had like 30 small red buttons. He could, you know, pick and choose kind of. Um, really it was kind of a one-time one hit and we never really solved the fail back, right? Because long, I think most of you here probably know that scenario, right? Like we've solved how to get there, but we don't care how to get back, right? Um, I see some nodding heads, so that's good. Um, and for them, right, once they moved production AWS, their long-term plan was just to take advantage of the global scale of AWS and not really worry about, you know, their colo facility with a single power source. Um, additionally, right, uh, automation was really complex, right, and more complex on premise than they had initially uh, thought, right? When we first got there, they said, oh, yeah, we've got, you know, we've got Puppet, and it's, it's, you know, it's building everything for us automatically, right? And we have, you know, everything set up, and, and everything's awesome on prem. Well, obviously, we kind of raise an eyebrow, because if that was the case, why did they get into this scenario of having release failures, right? Like something, something's not matching up here. And what we ended up seeing was that uh, that was not the case, right? That on premise was a mess. Um, that the amount of work it would take to kind of figure out the configuration drift on premise and make sure that that matched AWS would probably take years, right? And so again, we kind of went back to what are you really trying to accomplish here? Is it worth taking years just so that for a small amount of time you can run in kind of this hybrid model holistically across your entire environment? And what they determined is, you know what, let's just take our automation efforts, our really smart guys, Slalom's really smart guys, and let's just do the automation efforts in AWS. Uh, additionally, right, this idea of obviously you're kind of getting to this point maybe that we couldn't just lift and shift their architecture in the cloud. That wasn't really feasible. A lot of stuff did have to be refactored. A great example that I usually use is NFS, right? So how many of you guys have NFS storage in your, that your apps use uh, to share data? No, hands? All right, lots, right? I was like, well, maybe this is the only company. Um, <laughs> you know, so we had to look at, hey, what is it going to cost to build this NFS infrastructure in the cloud, highly available, you know, and cost efficient. And for a lot of use cases, it didn't make sense when you look at the price point because I could just use S3 if I changed out a few drivers, did a small app refactor. And that's just one of the many refactors that had to happen. So lift and shift really wasn't feasible. And as you see, it took 12 months. And it's still going on to this day, right? We, we're in AWS. The services are in AWS, but we're still making continuous improvements to automation. Uh, we're still finding better ways to take you know, advantage of services, uh, changing the artifact, artifact, or, uh, sorry, architecture, um, and, and gaining efficiencies, right? All right, so second story is about a financial services firm. Uh, what I'll say is this is, unlike the last firm that was, you know, the, the last company that was Oracle and kind of you know, big-time enterprise applications, right? This was uh, what I'll say is like the AWS use case, right? Even at an enterprise level. Um, they had a bunch of colo facilities that had out of capacity infrastructure, right? That was end of life. And they were looking at making a huge investment in infrastructure. 
Uh, they're also looking at scaling 10x in the coming years. Um, and their applications, their, their, their loan servicing origination platform was built on open source technologies, right? So if you look up, like, what's the AWS use case? This, I mean, there's lots of them, but this is like the top one, right? And so on paper, I was like, yeah, make me the program manager. I'm going to get a big success here, right? This is going to be great. Um, and I think the senior director of IT, you know, summed it up in another quote here, right? Our, our greatest challenge is in providing the capacity to meet the almost unknown future demands of the business. I think that's, you know, that's a great reason to use AWS, right? Because we kind of remove those capacity constraints as long as you have a checkbook. So ideal, you're going to see some, some commonalities here already, right? They almost had the exact same kind of like line that they gave us. Hey, we think we can just take our architecture and shove it in the cloud and do a big bang migration and everything's going to be awesome, right? And we think we can do it for all of our applications uh, for our entire loan servicing origination platform, and that was... I think 32 applications uh, plus about uh, 36 databases. Um, we can do it all in one night, right? Um, we should be able, the one thing we do want to do is we want to have auto scaling, right? We want to do this, right? This sounds awesome on paper. Uh, we want to be able to quickly respond to uh, the demands of the business that we don't know, right? Uh, but we want to focus on building our own services, similar, right? We want to build our own NFS infrastructure. We want to build uh, our own uh, load balancing infrastructure, right? We don't want to take advantage of the services of the platform because we don't know where we're going to be in a few years, right? And we think it's really powerful to own those services. Additionally, we don't think this is going to cause any impact to like, our dev teams or our release cycles, right? It should almost become like, transparent. Like one, one week they're developing in on-prem, and the next we're releasing AWS, and maybe some performance increases. But outside of that, right, they should have no uh, you know, real visibility into this. And I thought this was going to take about four months. All right, so what's the actual, right? Uh, we had two flops and one big bang, right? Um, so we failed uh, at the last hour of migration twice uh, to get CRC checks on the databases to uh, pass. And maybe a little technical for this presentation, but if you're a financial services firm and you need to move data, when the auditors come in, the first thing they're going to ask you is, hey, how did you confirm that your data that you, was here and you moved here was the, you know, the exact same copy and you didn't lose any transactional data? And so at, you know, at eight, six, 6 o'clock in the morning, after starting at 8 o'clock the previous night, right, <laughs> they all fail, right? And they failed twice for different reasons, which I won't go into. Um, we learned our lessons, and we finally had one big success, big bang, right? But man, that was like the thing I said I'd never do again when I got into consulting, right, is those all-night migrations, and here I was doing it again, right? Um, and it was pretty painful. Uh, but I will say once they were there, right, it worked. Uh, the apps, they got calls that, hey, you know, the, the interface is working great, it's performing great, um, this is awesome. Right? What did you guys do? Um, and that's what we wanted to hear. Uh, additionally, uh, automation required large investments of time from app SMEs. Right? So back to that thought that it would just be transparent. Really wasn't the case. Uh, you can't automate really what you don't know at a granular level. Right? And so they wanted to have this advanced automation. They needed to really uh, bring in their app SMEs who had you know, constructed these apps from the get-go um, and really discover what, what it was to actually automate. Uh, building services was cost and resource prohibitive. So again, when they actually got into uh, the cost-benefit analysis of, do I build my own service? Do I take advantage of S3? Do I take advantage of ELB? Um, and they looked at kind of like, you know, the bottom line. You know, their eyes kind of widened right, when they saw, holy cow, building my own services is really expensive, and I might not have a need to do that. Uh, it did impact release cycles, right? I mean, you're kinda, I kind of already hit on this, right? Uh, there was no way to get around the fact that we needed ask, app, app SMEs time, um, and that additionally, because we had two flops and one big bang, and they wanted to really complicate things, and they wanted to have the migration match up with releases, right? So the migration was a release, which I don't know why we did that. Um, there's a lesson learned right there, right? Don't do that. Um, it, it, it did heavily in, in impact uh, development flows. And for an organization that had been kind of continually sprinting for three weeks and releasing every three weeks, they're doing a really good job at that. Uh, this is pretty impactful kind of around the organization. Like, what do you mean I don't have my feature, right? I've been having my feature given to me every three weeks, like, for two years, right? And what's going on? Uh, why are we moving to the cloud, right? Kind of those doubts started to sneak in. Um, and it took eight months plus, right? Just like the last project, we're still working on Automation, we're still, uh, we're still, there's a few services that have nothing to do with the loan origination uh, platform that we're still moving. Um, but the actual, like I said, the, the big bang was successful and we did move there eventually. All right, so bringing it full circle. Commonalities, right? Uh, and I've hit on these already, but I just want to reiterate them. Uh, first, the estimation, right? The devil is in the details. Uh, 
you know, a lot of times when we just read a white paper or something like that, we have this idea in our head of, of what the, the migration for that single service is going to look like. But if we don't do appropriate planning, right, and the, the enterprise are really good at planning, right, um, we, we, might, we might undercut ourselves in terms of, uh, you know, the actual time we thought it was going to take. In both cases, and in, in most all of our migrations, um, applications had to be refactored to some extent. Right? That's kind of a you know, sliding scale in terms of how much refactoring was necessary. Uh, but in, yes, in both cases, it was uh, required. Additionally, automation tools and AWS platform services were heavily utilized throughout the architecture. Uh, and this is something I really didn't hit on, but the last two points uh, kind of go together. Uh, it was really a group effort, right? Um, a lot of times when companies call SLOM or, or AWS you know, refers a customer to SLOM, they say, hey, we guys, just, we want you to just move us to the cloud. Like, we don't want to have anything to do with it, right? Like, just get us there, right? Thanks. And we, we usually say that's not possible, right? Like, we, it needs to be a group effort between everybody involved, especially at the enterprise level, right? Because you're going to hit things like service limits on the wrong night, right, where all of a sudden you can't spin up any more instances. So you're going to need to have a contact at AWS to say, hey, I need you to escalate this. I can't wait six hours for that to happen, right? Just a small example. Um, and so it really is a group effort. And I think, and I know I'm a little biased here, and I'm kind of you know, making a pitch here, uh, I think that one of the biggest success factors right, is that they used SME resources from Psalm. Right? So bring in a partner when you want to do this. All right, so we want to get into the realities of app migrations. Um, I believe there's eight. I should have counted them. Uh, they kind of grew and shrunk a few times depending on like, the time I kept rehearsing this presentation. Right? And it was like 55 minutes, an hour, so I had to pull some and add some. Um, I think we have just about eight realities that, that are kind of the top eight. Uh, the first one, and I will not stick on this slide too long because I've said this already, but lift and shift migrations may not be as they seem on the surface, right? Uh, both stories kind of highlighted this. Uh, a lot of times, it, it completely appears technically viable on the surface. And I will say there are certain use cases for really simplistic apps that you can just extract and load uh, that configuration into the cloud. But most of the time, uh, th there's going to have to be some uh, some refactoring going on. And typically, if you do push forward with this lift and shift mindset, that means that you're really not focused on cloud optimizing your architecture. And kind of two big things come from that cloud optimizing your architecture. The first is it's really pricey, right? It gets really expensive. Uh, and a lot of times, one of the biggest benefits we push when we're trying to get cloud enablement going is that there's some, some cost savings, right? Or, or a different way of, of looking at cost. Um, but then the bill shows up and it's, you know, 5x what you initially estimated on your, your kind of like initial sheets for, for ROI and things like that. Um, additionally, right, we've also probably sold things like elasticity, uh, auto scaling, uh, global availability, stuff like that. And we're not cloud optimizing or not refactoring our infrastructures to take advantage of that. We probably won't actually realize a lot of those goals that our CIOs and leaders are reading about or hearing about at, at their um, you know, different talks and, and whatnot, right, or what's really selling them on cloud. We're probably not going to re actually realize that if we don't cloud optimize. And a, and a lot of times, uh, the, the biggest kind of pain point is that outages occur, right? We, we, we've assumed something about our on-prem architecture that's no longer valid from an architecture perspective in the cloud, and now we have a single point of failure we didn't think about. Um, and we get a message from AWS saying, hey, you know, we need to restart this host. Your, your VM is going to go down. And you say, I can't, you know, I can't take an outage on that. You know, what, what do you mean, right? And they said, well, we kind of told you from the get-go you needed to architect this in kind of two data centers, two availability zones, and you didn't account for that. So now you might have an outage, right? And all of this stuff leads to the last bullet point, which nobody wants, right? Failed cloud enablement efforts. Uh, a lot of times, if, if this was the route that was taken, uh, the pain points just add up, right, to the point where someone just says, all right, never mind, this isn't worth it. I don't think anybody really wants that, right? All right, next lesson learned goes right with lift and shift. And I won't hit on, like, why things need to be refactored. I'm just going to hit on, like, the lessons learned when you get into refactoring. But applications will have to be refactored for AWS to some extent. And what I'll say is fight the, reword, uh, the urge, right, to kind of mash a refactor with a rewrite, right? So a lot of times I hear, you know, we get into companies that say, hey, you know, we have, we have to change in the app architecture a little bit. Why don't we just change it completely from the ground up, right? Let's use this as an opportunity, uh, the next bullet, right, avoid the shiny stuff, to take that shiny stuff and now put it into our application. A great example is we have a customer right now um, who still convinced us that this was the right way to go, um, and they rewrote their entire application in Scala, um, which, I mean, it, it blew out the timeline like 3x, because every time we brought in an engineer, right, guess what we had to do? 
like here's your books on Scala, go learn them and see us in a month and then we'll kind of catch you up to where we are. Right? So the onboarding time for engineers was like atrocious, right? And so finding resources was really difficult uh, and uh, it took a long, long time for them to kind of realize the benefits of cloud and get their production app into the cloud. Addition, this is kind of goes without saying in any refactoring effort, right? Understand your dependencies and constraints. So many times, right, we just make a change uh, because we think it's the right thing without doing a good, you know, dependency mapping, right? Um, so, you know, don't, don't skip on that here. And, and also understand, like, constraints that exist outside of your application itself, right? A great example is with the loan origination, uh, the loan origination application. Um, we had the staging environment, the load environment in AWS, and it was running awesome, right? Like, people were saying, oh, I've never seen, you know, something this fast, right? And scaling, auto scaling was working and everything was going great. And so he said, all right, let's bump this guy up, right? Like, let's, you know, like an airplane, right? Let's, let's turn it up. Let's try to process 8,000 loans concurrently, right? Which would be like, I mean, that, that's ridiculous, right? So they had to do their, you know, their, their calculation on if you should get the money or not 8,000 times concurrently. Um, and we, we were slowly bumping it up for different reasons. You can read about this around ELBs and needing to bump it up slowly. Uh, we were kind of bumping it up. You know, we got to about 3,000, and everything just died, right? Everything stopped. Everything failed. And I was sitting there in New Relic and kind of looking at things while they were doing that. I said, you guys, I don't, I don't see any hit on the database, because that was the thing that wasn't really scaling uh, horizontally, right? Um, I don't see any load. Like, I, I don't understand why I failed. Uh, and the VP of uh, operations is like running towards us, right? So we're like, oh no. Um, and he goes, hey, I just got a call from uh, Equifax. You just crashed their load testing environment, right? So um, this is a great example of even in like non-prod environments, we have dependencies we can't think about. It's kind of an extreme example, but I like to share that one. Um, <laughs> so we, we crashed the credit bureaus. Uh, we should have we tried to get money or something at that point. Um, Additionally, right, and I kind of hit on this before, uh, complete a cost-benefit analysis when you are trying to decide what to refactor, right? Define the why I'm refactoring. Don't just refactor to refactor, right? And understand um, how much it's going to cost you to hold on to your existing architecture versus adopting something new, right? Um, additionally, you really do want to understand how much your existing architecture will cost you in AWS, because a lot of times people have like emotional buy-in, right, to what they've built on cloud, right? It's their baby, right? And so if you're saying, you know, oh, we're not going to use that anymore, we don't need NetApp anymore, right? We're just going to use S3, right? You know, you might just like crush a SAN administrator, right? Like that's been my life, you know? And so you have to say, well, this is what's going to cost us if we, if we have you administer like a, a virtual NFS appliance in the cloud. Again, I keep hitting on that one because that's the easy one. I can talk to you about other examples later. All right, so the next one. Uh, in the previous presentation, I think even in the keynote today, this term was used. And I think, I mean, how many of you have heard of technical debt? All right, how many of you are like damaged internally by technical debt? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, if, you, if you aren't damaged internally, uh, you might not know the definition because if, if you've been in operations or any kind of technology uh, job, you've like been hit by this at some point. Uh, so I'm going to quickly define what technical debt is to kind of set the stage here. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the definition that I took. There's lots of different ones out there. Um, the guy that actually created this term didn't do a very good job at like defining it like Webster's Dictionary. He just kind of talked about what he observed um, in code bases. But this is how I define it. So technical debt is a metaphor referring to debt created from legacy systems and long-maintained architectures. If the debt is not repaid by correcting the suboptimal solution, then it will continue to accumulate interest. This interest, will take, this interest takes the form of increasing complications when trying to resolve or repay. Right, so for me, like, this, is, this is probably why consulting, you know, consultants have a big job, right? Is because they're really good at solving these kind of things. All right, so why am I talking about technical debt and a migration project? Well, technical debt migrations are the collection agencies for technical debt, right? Um, they do a great job of just bubbling it to the surface and like, you know, asking you to come pay your debt, right? Because uh, you're making such an uh, enormous change to kind of the underlying infrastructure that if you don't pay this technical debt, uh, you will likely get into similar cloud enablement failures, right? And remember, right, that it, to take the approach that it's going to happen, right? I don't know uh, an, an architecture that's been around longer than, a few, than two years that isn't going to have some tremendous technical debt that's going to need to be de dealt with if you're moving it from on-prem into the cloud, or even moving it between data centers, right? Like, this, this has always happened, right? Um, but remember that it's going to happen, and it can be embarrassing, right? So don't play the blame game, right? Simply have a strategy for dealing with it, right? Know what's going to come up and just deal with it, right? Otherwise, um, everyone's going to get into the weeds about why it happened and, and, how, and how we should fire this guy, or it was Jim because Jim no longer works here. He's clearly the one that did it all. Um, 
And so like I said, have a strategy for dealing with it. And in, our, uh, in the last part of the presentation, I'll, I'll show what our strategy is. And it's kind of straightforward, but um, I'll share what our strategy is. And the last one, right, once you've kind of paid down this technical debt, uh, just like you know, those ads on TV, right? Like, you know, we can help you with your debt and then focus like, and educate you on how not to do it again, right? So that has to be your long-term goal is education and prevention. And we're really kind of coming to a fortunate time in IT where a lot of the things like agile, uh, configuration management, right? We're seeing a lot about deployment pipelines, right? These are all ways for us to educate and prevent long-term technical debt from kind of occurring again. Although I think it's always going to happen. I think there's always going to be uh, a boss that walks in the room and says, hey, wrap that up, work on this. Well, that wrapping up activity is where technical debt might be created, right? So I think that's always going to happen. All right, next lesson learned. Automation tooling plays a critical role in migration projects. But I'm giving kind of another warning here, right? Automation tooling is like an inheritance check in the mail, right? You, you want to avoid uh, automating for the sake of automating or going and buying that hot tub, right? Because you just got you know, 30 grand in the mail, right? You want to find a way to invest it and get an ROI on it. And really clearly define the why, just like the refactoring efforts, right? We have to do a cost benefit analysis and understand the why I'm automating this, right? And a lot of people take the approach when they're getting into this of saying, well, if it takes me an hour a week to do this task, right, and it's going to take me three weeks to automate it, is it really worth it? Uh, what's, what's my you know, return, right? And I think that's a too simplistic of an approach because sometimes that one hour task is like, uh, a, let's say, a, a job that has to uh, you know, be manually kicked off, but that thing does like reporting for one of the most critical reports going to, I don't know, for the loan origination app, let's say it goes to uh, the call centers, to the collection agencies, right? And that's, and that's error prone. Right? So is it worth it? Right? I think it might be right? if it's a critical operation to the, uh, the enterprise. Um, so really understand the why and go beyond just the simple kind of math of like, well, this is my investment to automate it, and this is how much it takes you know, every time I do it. Also understand that, and this is something you have to kind of educate uh, other teams on, is that your automation projects are continuous improvement projects. Right? You get better and better at automating. You learn more and more about your applications, and you're kind of continually refactoring your automation. And you're continually learning about like how automation can like help you work better, right? And so a lot of times we get into automation projects that are coupled with migration projects. They stop when the migration project is done. And that's the wrong way to look at it, right? Because usually the goals of automation in a migration project is kind of repeatable building of environments, right? And not like solving your day-to-day -day job, right? Or helping you in your day-to-day -day job. And so um, once the migration project is over, don't just you know, say, okay, all the automation projects are over as well. Like continue to, to drive on that momentum. And lastly, in this, you know, we would think it would be pretty straightforward, um, but I have seen it in person, uh, someone taking uh, their automation artifacts and, and treating them not like code bases in the sense that they went up to like, the, you know, the puppet repo online and said, oh, I need to automate this web logic server. Oh, look, there's a, there's a template here. I'll just grab it and run it in production and see what happens. Like, absolute insanity, right? So you have to treat your automation artifacts like you would your code bases. You need to you know, use things like um, you know, Test Kitchen for Chef. You need to have testing frameworks. You need to have standardization around how to write uh, your different artifacts. And you obviously have to check them into version control. All right, next one, and I've hit on this as well, uh, but I'm just kind of reiterating it so I don't have to stay up all night again when, if, if you want me to help me with your, your project. Um, that is that big, big bang migrations are really troublesome, right? And they're, they're troublesome not just for my sleep patterns, right? They're also troublesome because they really delay critical production validation, right? And because we just heard in the last presentation, right, that hybrid solutions are completely valid in most scenarios, right? Sometimes you can't split up like the, you know, the database from the app service. I mean, there's just two, you know, can't, if it's delay sensitive, you might not be able to do that. But in most cases, hybrid is completely valid. And so there's really no reason to say, hey, we're going to wait until the end of the project to turn everything on in production, right? We can take a much smaller, like, you know, smaller batch size into to what we're moving into production and start to get that production validation of our ideas, our architectures, um, and what we think our workloads are going to look like on AWS. Additionally, uh, if we stay away from Big Bang, it really helps our uh, operational resources, right? Who uh, I think there was a question in the previous presentation about, hey, like, how do I get my operations guys on board with AWS, right? Well, the best way is to not give them the entire production environment in one night and tell them to go operate it, right? Rather, let's give them small environments at a time and let them gradually learn about how to operate uh, you know, resources in AWS. <laughs> Additionally, right, not only is the production validation not happening until the end, but also all the benefits of AWS might not be happening until the end, right, at a, pro at a production level, which um, I will say, uh, you know, the next bullet is probably sums it up the best, right? 
the actual migration project itself isn't the benefit you want to share. Uh, it's rather the new capabilities realized once you're in AWS, right? So it's like once you get there, you're just starting, right? Um, so like why delay that? There's usually not a reason. And I think if we really think about why big bangs happen, it probably comes from like the, the data center migration days, right? Where what was like our longest lead time was like procurement and getting cross connects, right? <laughs> like those things could you know, push a migration out years, right? And so we'd always just kind of wait until the end because we didn't have any choice. But now we kind of do have a choice. So try to avoid big bang wherever possible. Next one, uh, limit focus put on building your own services. Understand that cloud enables a constant conversation between building your own and consuming a service. And this is a big one to hit on. Um, you know, and I've kind of hit on this already in the presentation, but I think there's a simple way to go about looking at this. Uh, ask a few questions, right? And the first is, uh, is this service that I might want to consume, is it an industry standard protocol that I interact with it on? A great example is simple email service, right? Is that an industry standard protocol? Yeah, it's simple mail transfer protocol, right? We've, we have that everywhere. Um, and if I get a yes there, and then I would go on to the next question, was does it have the available features that I want? And if it checks all my boxes that I need to, to work with it, then why wouldn't I use it, right? Um, someone might, I could get some hands raising there and probably tell me why they think they shouldn't use it. Um, but for me, if those two are yeses, then I, I don't understand why we can't use it. Um, but even if we get a no on the industry standard protocol, right? So another example I'll use is a simple queuing service, right? So it uses a proprietary agent that's installed on the machine. Um, but in my mind, right, even if the, ser the service has a proprietary component, uh, the next question you ask is, does it still fit into like a standard acceptable architecture? Well, queuing does, right? Queuing is a, like a standard thing in distributed systems. So if, if I already take advantage of queuing in my app, that's great, but likely I probably don't, and I'm using the cloud as a, as, a, as a way to refactor my app to use queuing services, that effort isn't going to go for waste if later you want to use a different queuing service, right? Because I've architected my app to use queues, and queuing is a standard thing. It just has a small proprietary driver in it. So I think that what I'm saying is the scope of change will still will be limited even if there's a small proprietary component. And the last thing, and I think this is really important uh, because the enterprise is great at this, right? Uh, make sure that you're selecting the right cloud vendor up front. I mean, I've been part of so many RFIs and RFPs. The, the enterprise does an amazing job at coming up with like selection criteria I could never imagine, right? And they do a great job. It's like like taking you know months, years, right, to say, okay, finally we're going to work with this vendor, right? We've identified them as the one, right? And so you've likely taken the same approach with the cloud. And so just like if you've invested in Oracle, like why wouldn't you? Would you say like, well, if Oracle has a proprietary component, which it does everywhere, right? Like. Am I not going to invest in that component inside of Oracle? Probably not, right? So the same should hold true for cloud providers. Like if I'm selecting AWS because I've done my due diligence, then I should really invest holistically in taking advantage of the services wherever possible. All right, um, I apologize, I don't have a clock, so I don't know how we're doing. So hopefully I have enough time for q and I'm going to kind of push through this section because usually um, uh, this talk takes about 50 to 55 minutes. So here's our straightforward approach, right? And I tried to put this in as plain English as I could, and I'll get into each one of these uh, boxes. I used a straightforward PowerPoint you know, uh, you know, the diagram here. This is nothing special. This is nothing you know, marketing material, but this is just kind of how we do it, right? So the first thing we do is we do an app analysis. Uh, that an app analysis drives uh, a backlog and t-shirt sizing activity. And I'll explain what that is. That's maybe like the, the only non-English there. Um, we build a supporting pipeline, then we focus on non-prod, and we, we focus on prod, and then we focus on optimization. Right? So pretty straightforward. All right, so performing an app analysis. Uh, the first thing I'll hit on is, I don't know why I made it so small, but the outputs right, are current state gap analysis, and we're taking kind of a playbook out of a manufacturer and a product roadmap. Right? And I'm going to hit on exactly what goes into these. Um, in, in the next two slides. And I'm sorry if I'm being redundant for some of you that know about gap analysis and you know, product roadmaps and things like that, but too many times I get in there and they go, you know, what, what am I getting with the gap analysis? Why, why would we do this? Um, so I'm just going to cover the basis here. So the first thing a gap analysis needs is a standard to compare your current state against, right? Uh, and here is some great information on a standard or information for you to develop your own standard, right? So 12factor.net. Um, if, if you haven't seen this, this is one of the uh, greatest sites ever created, right? It's really simple, but it's a great manifest on how to build like proper applications for the cloud. Um, and so they go deep into each one of those items on what's the right way to do it. A great example is the code base, right? So there should be one code base, and that code base should be the same uh, for every deployment, right? And just one example, right? And they go into each one of these areas, right? So it's a great baseline, right? Uh, 12factor.net, can't push it hard enough. 
Additionally, we want to maybe take off our 12-factor hat and put on our AWS hat and think about how these things just might be a little bit different in AWS. And the Architecture Center has uh, just an amazing amount of information out there on how to, um, like I said, baseline your application or develop your standard for AWS. Um, so I don't need to really rehash all this stuff because, like I said, it all exists out there. Happy to talk to you later about it. I'll put up my contact information if you have questions about any of this stuff or want to kind of chat about you know, maybe what goes into a standard. Uh, feel free to reach out. All right, so current state gap analysis. In no way is that picture meant to be the only way it's supposed to look, right? Because there is really no right format. You can use an Excel, you can use a Word doc, you can use Confluence, whatever you want, right? It's all about the goal, right? And the goal is to compare current state against a standard. And once you've done that, we want to highlight where our biggest gaps are. And then we want to theorize how to close those gaps, right? Like with changes to our architecture, bringing in services, uh, doing different things, right? Maybe moving it to the cloud is just the way to close the gap. So once we have that gap analysis and we're kind of we've theorized about the activities we need to do to close those gaps, we put those into a product roadmap, right? Typically it contains a phase plan uh, for architecture changes and migration activities. Um, it's usually a little bit higher level, right? Because we want to use it for cross-team and executive level communication, and it should be pretty straightforward. And I'm sure if you know if you've been in the enterprise, you've probably seen these things. So again, I don't want to hit on this too much, and sorry if you've already done this. Um, and the big thing here is that it drives current and long-term project efforts. And I will say the one thing that, I, that, that gets me when I get into these things is that I'll publish this the first week of the project, right, after we've done our planning and things like that. And eight weeks later, someone will walk up to me with that exact version and say, okay, so where are we exactly in this? And I'll say, well, that's all wrong now, right, because it's changed with what we know now. And you know, they give me that look, like, what do you mean? I thought this was you know, doctrine, right? Like, you published this. So I always intro it now with saying, like, hey, you should go to this location to download the latest product roadmap and understand where the direction of the project is changing. All right, the next piece is we're constructing our backlog and doing our uh, t-shirt sizing. So this comes from Agile, uh, the t-shirt sizing idea, right? Uh, the backlog obviously comes from just normal planning. Um, but uh, the goal of this, right, is to really at a granular level for that first phase that we've identified in our roadmap, come up with what are the actual tasks that need to be accomplished. What I would say is a pretty acceptable timeline for a first phase is about three months. Um, any farther than that, and it's, it's probably not accurate. Even three months is, is pushing it sometimes. Uh, so once we've identified things like a, a high-level task description and acceptance criteria, this is a real line item from a real backlog activity, um, and we've identified some assumptions, the next thing we do is we assign a complexity rating, right? So, and this is not meant to be an agile training course. I'm not going to go into this too deep, and I don't really, I mean, if you have questions on it, come up to me afterwards. I prefer you don't ask it, because um, like I said, not an agile training course. But um, we want to assign a complexity rating, right, a small, medium, and large. And the, and the most important thing to kind of remember about agile planning is that this is not about time, right? So I shouldn't be saying, well, small is one day, right? No, small might be equivalent to, like, uh, making a change on a load balancer, right? So maybe I baseline it with another task, but in no way do I baseline it with a time. It's all about complexity, right? And it's a scale of complexity that I define as a team, right? So is medium twice as complicated as small, or is it four times as complicated, right? I define that, and then I advertise typically how many small, medium, and larges I can finish in, let's say, a two-week time period, right? That's typically the approach we take. We've got a pretty mature agile organization within Psalm, and so we kind of take those practices and apply them to our migration projects. All right, the next one, and I promised I'd share what our uh, biggest strategy is for dealing with technical debt, and this is it, right? We build a pipeline. Uh, we architect and build a pipeline. Uh, there's, an, there's a presentation, I think, coming up next. Um, maybe it's happening now. I, so I, didn't, I don't know the schedule by heart. But specifically, and I think these will all be posted to YouTube, so you can go back and grab that content later. But where they're talking about how to build pipelines in AWS with some of the new services that are coming out. Um, but we think that this is extremely critical to migration projects because they act as like migration factories, right? They give me a way to repeatedly build environments, test things, um, and at the end of the day, deal with technical debt, right? So when I find something that needs to be refactored, or maybe I find a set, like a great example, right, is in, in, in load balance or settings and in timeouts, right? So a lot of times when we're trying to configure the ELB to work right, um, there's lots of little modifications that need to be made. And the first time we did this on a pretty complex project, after like three hours of, of doing this, right, we looked up and said, okay, what did we just do? Like, what's, oh, I don't know, right? And if we had instead maybe put that into uh, like infrastructure as code, like CloudFormation, those changes, right, we could have then checked it into the pipeline and gone and provisioned it into the environment and that would have all been captured there, right? And we would have had to kind of rework and possibly miss something and create more technical debt. So this is how we deal with technical debt is with a deployment pipeline. At a minimum, 
Uh, and in no way is this meant to be like the single definition of a deployment pipeline. But typically, our, our deployment pipelines consist of a repository or multiple repositories, uh, a build server, an orchestration server. Sometimes those two things can be the same. Uh, but they do have different use cases within a pipeline. Uh, CM tooling, and then I think the most important one is log management by far. And it's always the one that's kind of overlooked is logs. So once we have all of that set up, right, now we can finally start migrating. But guess what? We start in non-prod. We don't go to prod right away. Uh, we crawl, walk, run, right? Uh, we, and this, the biggest reason we start in non-prod is because it allows our engineering teams to learn about AWS, right? Because they're the ones that's going to likely be making the refactors to the app, right? And they need to best understand how to interact with the APIs. And this isn't something that you know, they, they instantly learn, right? It, it does have a learning curve to it. So uh, we want to start in non-prod and get the engineering teams like familiar with AWS, right? Additionally, uh, even if it is non-prod, we still start to realize some of the benefits of AWS, right? A lot of times for engineering teams, the biggest bottleneck is getting infrastructure, right? And so if they're suddenly in AWS and working in AWS, they're starting to see like kind of the constraints lifted, right? And they're able to start to maybe rubber stamp some environments out and get their dev environments rolling much faster, at least their integration environments. Additionally, in initial, it's kind of the, it limits the initial risk, right, of operating in the cloud. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's usually a security guy out there saying, like, wait, why are we moving to the cloud? You know, like, help me justify this, right? Um, but a lot of times you just say, oh, we're just doing dev, you know, no big deal. Uh, he'll be like, okay, you know, like, get into the cloud, it's fine. Um, that's not always the conversation, I should say. Sometimes it's still like, wait, no, you didn't, you didn't come to me first. Um, again, it, it limits the scope uh, of operating the cloud and the risk associated with it. Additionally, right, uh, we can start in dev and ensure that those artifacts that we use to build dev are the same ones used to build staging, you know, prod, pre-prod, whatever you call your environments, right? And this is really hard to kind of reverse engineer, right? So if we have artifacts to build prod and it didn't really start in dev, trying to get development or engineering to take those artifacts and use them, uh, kind of like a top-down approach, uh, typically doesn't work very well. I mean, I've, I've gotten into so many projects where it's like, hey, uh, operations wants us to use these automation scripts that they built, but we don't feel comfortable with it, right? So um, if we go the other way, a lot of times there's less, uh, not to say operations doesn't take a similar um, kind of stance sometimes, but uh, it's, it's sometimes a little bit easier to go the other way. And this is the big one, right? Once non-prod environments are conquered, um, we can say we've migrated, right, putting the flag in the ground. Uh, other environments follow suit pretty quickly. All right, so the next thing, right, we've got our non-prod environments up in the cloud for that app or that service. Uh, it's time to tackle prod. And you'll see here that there isn't much technical content up here, right? Because if you've done it the right way and you have your deployment pipeline, the greatest obstacles in prod migrations are operational sign-off, right? Getting them out, like, on board with your app running in the cloud and, and, and the operations teams actually operating it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And as the migration team or the people pushing this, you have to be ready to answer the really hard questions about AWS, whether it's to a, you know, a security personnel or um, to, to an operations resource that's just wondering, you know, how do I actually deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and in my mind, we should kind of feel honored by that, right? That now we're the SMEs of AWS and we're kind of passing the knowledge on, right? And there's ways uh, to kind of do this in a, in a semi-automated fashion, right? As long as we take the approach that the migration project in itself should be also like a continuous education project where we're uh, taking our product roadmap, we're taking the stuff we're doing, and we're, we're educating uh, all the other teams on this, right, and kind of evangelizing for our project. And you can even automate some of this, right? We've gotten really good at automatically creating Word documents and emailing them out with things like uh, project status, you know, uh, performance reports from load testing. Um, all that can be done, right, in a repeatable fashion. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason. It's really not that complicated. Um, I can give you some engineering contacts if you'd like to come up afterwards about uh, what they've done to do that. And the last one, right, and this is probably the most critical step to prod migration, is really work on getting sign-off not only on it just running in the cloud, but extending that pipeline that you've been using to migrate your other environments to production, right? And a lot of times what that means is now you're going to have to bring the operations teams into uh, your actual pipeline operations, right? And that's sometimes a really steep learning curve, right? Uh, so you kind of have to take the same approach to the pipeline, which is I'm going to have to continually educate these guys on what we're doing from a pipeline perspective. But hopefully we can get there, plug in our production pipeline into the production account, and, and move that environment you know, automatically. Because uh, the last thing we want to do is have done this automatically, you know, automatically 300 times, right? And then get to prod and have to figure out how to do it manually. Likely there's going to be uh, some errors that happen. All right, last slide, and then we'll open up the Q&A. Um, so 
Uh, once you get the prod, as I said, the migration itself is not the benefit we want to really advertise, right? It's what we can do when we get there, right? So it's time to optimize. How you have to optimize, though, is you first have to get a baseline, right? So a lot of times when we get to cloud, uh, they say, okay, how are we going to buy reserved instances? How are we going to uh, right-size infrastructure? I said, well, it's going to take a few months, right? Because we have to get a baseline, right, of how our, how our apps work in the cloud, um, how they perform in the cloud. Um, and once we have that baseline, uh, then we can start to figure out where we're going to uh, make changes, right? Additionally, uh, we have to utilize logging extensively. As so many times, right, we've relied on premise in terms of performance monitoring and things like that on things that come from our infrastructure, right? So maybe we have an uh, instrument that's plugged into our you know, virtualization farm, right, that gives us like CPU and memory and things like that. And that stuff still is completely valid in the cloud. But to a certain extent, we don't have to worry about that anymore outside of like if our instance itself is running out of memory, not if the host is running out of memory. And so it gives us a really good opportunity, uh, like they said in the, the keynote today, right? If we've got that 30% additional bandwidth of our resources, right? If we can get them focused on logging, right, and really learning not only how to do appropriate logging, but also how to read the logs, uh, that's going to be able to really give us good ideas of how to refactor our application and make improvements. Uh, so many times, like, timestamps are off, or uh, the format of the logs and they're coming in is just off, right? And that, something that needs to be fixed. The best way to fix that, by the way, is just to take the developer or the engineer and make him operate the app with logs for a week, and that just seems to solve the problem because he realizes, like, what he's done, right? Right. Uh, so once we have our baseline, once we're taking logging seriously, then we can start to improve cost, performance, uh, efficiencies of components, right? And then, just like the last slide, right, we continually have to educate on where we're going and the improvements we're making with our kind of living, breathing roadmap. All right, so hopefully that gave you a good approach to moving to the cloud. Um, I'll open up the questions. Uh, how much time do we have left? Two minutes, wow. I'm sorry, guys. Preacher up here. Um, all right, so questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can you talk about the categories of things that need to be refactoring and, and, and how you kind of assess applications in terms of how much refactoring? I mean, does it have to deal with scalability or the applications are monolithic and they need to be split up or, or yep. they assume a more robust environment than you get in the cloud? I mean, what, can you get some depth? Yeah, no, there? great question. Um, appreciate that. So um, usually we have to look at, yeah, is, is exactly how we're building app servers today, right? So. Uh, it does depend on the environment, uh, but for example, a lot of times uh, the first category you look at is like, how do you provision app servers today, and how do you provision applications, right? How are they broken up onto the actual uh, application servers, how they load balance, right? A lot of times that's going to be the biggest blocker in terms of allowing us to have elasticity, right? So that's usually the first thing we look at. Um, and a lot of things happen within there, right? How we provision our applications, how we handle load balancing. Um, another piece to look at, right, is um, you know, how our dependencies are working, right, in, in terms of uh, different services, right? So I'll say, like, core services is probably something you really have to pay attention to, like authentication, file sharing, um, any of the things that are kind of outside of the application. That's usually where a lot of refactor has to, especially has to happen, right, when you want to take advantage of AWS services. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pro there's probably more. Um, and like I said, if you want to come up afterwards, I can give you my card and we can keep chatting about different kind of categories. I got did, one more question. Yeah. It looks like you didn't address uh, the issue of migrating from on-premise to uh, cloud, the uh, high scalability and high availability issues. Uh, can you address that a little bit? High availability and high scalability issues. Sure. So I, just to kind of rephrase what you're asking, or to make sure I understand it right, um, you're asking, hey, if I'm moving kind of a, an application that is kind of assuming uh, architecture paradigms that are available on premise for like availability and elast or maybe no elasticity, but at least availability. How do I account for that in getting in the cloud? Um, well, obviously the first one, right, is you're going to have to figure out, uh, you know, can I support load balancing, right? I mean, that's like the big one, right? Or can I afford a data center failure, right, with that with that application component? And you really have to look at the app itself, right? Because in most of our hypervisor uh, infrastructures, we usually have something that provides that high availability, like let's say VMware's HA. Right? And we no longer have that, right? And so we have to architect it uh, from the ground up to be able to run in two data centers at once, right? So um, obviously you'll have to understand things like, like what's my RTO, RPO, right? For that, for that piece, can I afford maybe a few minute outage or does it have to be active, active, stuff like that? So um, how to address that challenge is going component by component and seeing how do I architect this to, to work in two what are called availability zones within AWS. So actually it's not one mapping. You know, it's not that straightforward. A lot of issues, uh, you have to add a high scalability and high availability because uh, on a premise application, a lot of, you know, uh, most cases, they even don't address those kind of issues, you know. 
Sure. So even at the you're saying like the code base layer, understanding what are the limitations. Yeah. So you know, I, I guess I don't have an easy answer for that one, right? Um, you have to sit down with your 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 dev team and say, listen, this is what we want to take advantage of. These are the services. This is what we want it to look like. Where are our limitations, right? And then just so go systematically through and say, you know. And the addition thing, one other thing I'll say is that um, is that at 500, let's say, whatever your number is, is not going to be the same at 5,000, right? So as you think about scaling, right? Try to solve for what you actually know. Um, and keep the, the actual uh, kind of scope limited, right? Because you'll make assumptions about what you think 5,000 is going to look like. That's not really valid, and you'll miss something, right? And so, but then when you get to 5,000, whatever that 5,000 is, right, you're going to say, oh, I've missed this piece, right? I'm going to need funding to go figure that out. Instead, if you advertise this, hey, we're going to solve for 500 because we're at 250 today, and that's going to be our scope. And when we start to grow more, we'll solve then. Well, that's usually the approach I take on that. Uh, we are out of time. Um, so again, uh, feel free to come up to me afterwards. My contact is right there. I've got cards. Um, so yeah. <laughs>